So what are the dimensions of intimacy? There are three major dimensions of intimacy. Number one, revelation-based intimacy. Number two, faith-based intimacy. And number three, consecration-based intimacy. These are the three major dimensions of intimacy. There's an intimacy that is based on your revelation of God. That you just have that revelation, you know you are with God all the time. You, the consciousness of God is heavy on your life just by knowing it. So you find some people who carry so much of God's presence and power. It's not because they fasted much. They have a revelation that God is with them. And so because of that revelation and the consciousness that is built, the presence permeates that consciousness. And they move with so much cloud of glory. And then there are others that have faith based intimacy. They know the power of God is on their lives. So when they come to a place, they are stirred and they begin to do things. And you are wondering, how now? Me and you were eating bread two hours ago. How can you leave eating bread and you went for miracle service? There is a stirring of the spirit that he has mastered. So all his life, he will keep that stirring active. If he comes anywhere and that stirring happens, he knows God is there. Kenneth Hagin said, when he goes to preach, if his thumb becomes numb, and he's not feeling any sensation again. He knows that the weight of God's glory is heavy. He said he will start running and touching every sick person. As in, he will literally be running. Anybody he touches within that time is healed of whatsoever. Because he has come to understand that when this operation happens, this is what it means. It means the angel of God's presence is with me. And he has built his faith along that line. It's a faith-based dimension of intimacy. When you walk into a place... Sometimes you sense something in your heart. You just know that God is here. You will rest. You will be talking as if you are in the third heaven. And somebody is looking at you and say, Why are you so sure? I have learned this faith dimension. And then there is a consecration based intimacy. If you pray in tongues for 12 hours, every time you pray in tongues for 12 hours, your consciousness must touch God. And if you like, enter a desert, God will be there. If you fast for three days dry, anywhere you enter, the glory of God must be there. You have known it. That for you, this is your spiritual threshold. If you cross it, you must encounter God. That's a consecration-based intimacy. So if you want to have a relationship with God, you must maintain that three days fast. If you want to have a revelation with God, you must maintain that 15 hours fast. A prayer. Now, somebody who operates intimacy by revelation, may come to you and say no kill yourself ah this thing is not all about prayer if you stop you are finished because what breaks you into god's realm is 12 hours prayer if you don't hit it you cannot your consciousness can't trap god meanwhile that other person he just stands up and he's walking around he's walking around he just hears and he shall be in you and with you forever praise god he will move with a consciousness god will start moving he will say that's how he has grown. But for a Christian who wants to have the fullness of God, he will have to master the three. From revelation to faith and to consecration. So let's join it quickly. Let's begin with revelation-based intimacy. There are two aspects to this dimension of intimacy. The first aspect is to know God's position in his interaction with you. So this intimacy on the strength of revelation is positional. And I can tell you, you must by the spirit migrate in your walk with God through all of these positions. If your walk with God will be robust. So it is a, revela a revelational position of God type of intimacy. Now for people who have prayed this, there are those who believe God is in heaven. That's their revelation of God. There are those who believe God is in men. And there are those who believe God is in them. 
depending on which of this revelation is dormant in your life your work with god may suffer or may prosper and the scripture upholds all of these three i'll show you very quickly matthew chapter 6 verse 9 jesus was teaching them how to pray and he said after this manner therefore pray ye our father which art in heaven hallow be thy name so even jesus had this revelation that god is in heaven so if you want to really have a relationship with god you must have a revelation of the god that is in heaven and i will show you the impact of this revelation when you find a man who walks in lack and who always walks in fear is because he doesn't know that his god is in heaven so for example when he's praying for supplies he thinks that god is limited to his salary when he's praying for prosperity or for power for god to do something he thinks god is limited to his ecosystem it was on the strength of this revelation that jesus said thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread so this revelation means god is not limited by anything in your surrounding so when you find people who do great exploit most times it's because they know that their god is in heaven paul said my god shall supply all your needs according to his riches not the riches of your government the reason most people struggle to serve god is because they don't know god is in heaven they think god is part of the government they think god is part of the banking system so when god tells them sometimes god tells them give 90 percent of your salary for five months <laughs> they say father we are in nigeria sir i don't know if you you know <laughs> we are here hey, no it can't be god this is the devil and they will bind it but if you know your god is in a realm of limitless supply there is a consciousness it will bring into you on the strength of that consciousness there is an attraction that will come in your work with god so when jesus was teaching them to pray he brought them the consciousness that god is in heaven now god is not only in heaven it doesn't stop there you must also have the revelation that god is in men because all of these revelations have advantages and impact on your work with god if you know that god is in men you will know what to expect and what you can receive depending on who is talking so when you know that god is operating in a particular man as a healing power anytime that man is around you know that healing is possible and on the strength of that healing god will become real to you if you know that somebody has operated god operates through him as one who prospers anytime that man is around the consciousness of the god who prospers will become heavy on you and so you will see that when different people are ministering you will experience god at different levels there are some people who are talking fire hunger for prayer hunger for god's presence will be activated on your inside why because when they are talking that consciousness of god is activated and you can engage those people and live there and your work with god will increase there are some people that when they are ministering the consciousness of god the healer will become strong on you and even when you leave that meeting you will start seeking the god that heals so their expression of god will stare much hunger and relationship for god in you so you need to know that men carry god and if you know that men carry god when you meet those men you will look away from them and collect or touch the god that they carry i show you a scripture very quickly acts 11 verse 20 to 23 you see the bible spoke about now this was before barnabas came to antioch it says some of them were men of cyprus and cyrene which when they were come to antioch spake unto the grecians preaching the lord jesus go to the next verse and the hand of the lord was with them and a great number believed and turned to the lord are you seeing why these people believed are you seeing why these people turned to the lord they turned to the lord because the hand of god was upon the people who brought god to them so there are men that when they show up they provoke intimacy in your own heart for god so a great number of people turned to the lord because some disciples from cyprus and cyrene came with god as they encountered those people because of those people they encountered god but that's not where intimacy stops you also need to know that god is in you 
Because if you don't know that God is in you, and you only know that God is in heaven, and God is in men, your journey with God will not be far. You know why? If you only think God is in, is in men, and you only encounter God when you see men manifest God, your experience of God will be tied to when you meet those men. That's the limitation. And there are many people who will never sense the glory of God until a worshiper is singing. And so when they come to church and somebody is singing under the anointing, they are weeping. They are experiencing God. The moment keyboard stops or the mic go off, their tears will dry up. And if they finish from that service until they come back next Sunday and the person is ministering. So their relationship with God is tied to when this person who carries God is ministering. Because of that level of thwarted relationship, they cannot grow. Because they meet God Sunday to Sunday. Meanwhile, there are six other days in between the Sundays. So they encounter God when somebody ministers. On Monday, the devil approves everything they have touched. And they go back to iniquity before they come back the next Sunday. So their work with God is up and down. Up and down. You cannot find consistency. For those who think God is only in heaven, sometimes they now fill their work with God with rituals. Because you know what? somewhere unconsciously they will feel that god is far away that's why you see most times when we are praying we want to do a lot of rituals because we think that we want to get the attention of this distant god those days when i go to pray sometimes i will close my eye and i'll be looking whether a light has come or whether there's a sound somewhere and the problem is that sometimes you hear a sound or you see a light after eight months and when you now see something from the spirit realm that for that two weeks you, you are walking like a man of god anybody you meet you tell them god is real i was praying yesterday and light appeared on the wall i saw light the light was like the sun after two weeks you will go down you will now start another ritual looking for the god that is far in heaven and so even those people who believe or know that god is in heaven they are limited their relationship with God is not consistent. That's why a man can go and off light and he's sinning. Because he thinks God is in heaven. <laughs> if he comes to church, it's like this. All of us are pious in church. When, when you talk to somebody in church, he will turn and say, bless you. Even when you offend him, he will contain himself and say, it, it, it is well. <laughs> because why? Now God is here. But when he steps out of the church, oh boy, you wait till they happen. How far now? Uh, okay, uh, 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 no problem. Uh, they come, uh, they come. You even lower your voice to talk because you think he's in heaven, he can't hear. That's why your work with God is fluctuated because you think God is in heaven and you have the revelation that God is in man, but you don't know God is here. If you know God is here, there's no way you can off light enough for God not to see you. If you know God is here, there's no way you can talk under your voice and he will not hear. You now know that you are naked before him. And because of that, even when you are in the bathroom, you are conscious of God. As you are driving, you are conscious of God. Because this God is not only in heaven and you encounter him when you go to knee on your altar. Because the people who, who know that God is in heaven, they become conscious of, of God when they are in their prayer closet. And so the moment they enter their prayer closet, they want to ascend to heaven. So at that time, they become spiritual. They become conscious of God. And the moment they come out of their prayer closet, God has gone back to heaven. They are also going back to their business. So they are not strong. But when you know that, yes, God is in heaven. Yes, God is in men. But God is also in you. You can have a powerful prayer service driving your car. You can have a powerful fellowship session while you are having your bath. In fact, some of the voice of God will come to you in the bathroom. Most times, as what a pause on you, you will come alive. And God will start talking. You will run out of your bathroom and carry paper. And you are writing. If you can't, you will put your phone on record and you will be saying it. Because God is with you all the time. If you want to have a rich relationship with God, the first revelation you must have is that God is not only in heaven. God is not only in men. God is also in you. That's the foundation of intimacy. It's on this note that even when you sin, you know God is with you. And you can boldly come to him and say forgive. And it's on this note also that that consciousness to live holy and righteous 
will subdue your appetite. Because now you know there's nowhere you can hide from God. When you are chatting with somebody on the phone, nobody is hearing, but you know God is on your inside. He is thinking with you. So that thought you created, he heard it. Even before you uttered it, the moment you created that thought, he heard it. Now, when that consciousness inundates you, your work with God will become rich. Because the point will come, you will even pray in your heart. Because you know God is there and he's hearing you. Because if you don't have the opportunity to pray loud, you know God is in your heart. So you can have a very strong prayer session in your heart. Very strong. And you are walking. Nobody knows what is happening. You know, people who think God is in heaven. We are not this religion that put megaphone somewhere and you are shouting. Some people now can't even pray until they shout. That's why I tell my people here, follow the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Live activity. There are times when you are praying, God will man to you like a warrior. The prayer will be an act of war. And there are other times when God will suck you into himself. You can't even pray, you'll be crying. If you know that God is in you, when you are praying or interacting with God, you'll be more conscious of what is happening inside you than what is happening outside. And on the strength of that, your relationship with God will never fluctuate. It will be constant. Because even when you don't have the permission or the, the opportunity to do it the way you would have loved to do it, you will do it all the same. When you have the time, you can separate yourself to pray. When you have the time, you can lock the door in your prayer room and pace the floor. But even if you don't have that opportunity, you can still be in the spirit every day of your life. Imagine if they relocated you to Saudi Arabia. And you must shout before you pray. It means your walk with God will die. Because if you shout, your head will hang on the rope immediately. You, you will go to heaven quickly. And the Bible says, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of a saint. So when you come, they will welcome you with joy. Are you seeing this? Now, why is it important to know this? Because there are some people that, if they have not prayed loud for three days, they now start feeling guilty. You know what they are thinking? They have not spoken to God. In the last three days, they have not prayed. In the last three days, they have not had a relationship with God. And the devil will now say, yes, it's true. Ah, see this thing you have done now. Your ministry has gone. Ah, this fire you caught has gone. And then they will now start crying. They will start weeping. Guilt will come. And truly, their work with God will collapse. But if you know that God is on your inside, when you can pray with your mouth and pray loud, you will pray. When you cannot, you will also pray with your heart. And you will not have any sense of guilt that I didn't pray, I didn't talk to God. Because when you were praying with your mouth or you were praying with your heart, you were equally interacting with God. That's why Ephesians 3.20 says, God is able to do exceedingly above all that you can ask or what? Think. Because even when you are thinking, you are communing with God. Because God is on your inside. If you don't know this, you can't grow in intimacy. You cannot grow in intimacy. I'm telling you that many persons, the guilt of missing prayer or the guilt of missing study time has caused them to lose their fire much more than sin itself. And many persons, unless they do an, an, a particular activity, they've not talked to God. All of those things can become rituals and they will become dead works. Are they important? Yes. When you have the opportunity, do them and do them well. But if you don't have the opportunity, also be rest assured that you can talk to God in your heart because God lives there. Because some of you here, God may promote you. You may have a job where you walk from 8 to 10 p.m. or you walk from 8 to 8 p.m. or 8 to 5 p.m. and you may not have the luxury necessarily, sometimes for 5 years, sometimes for 10 years. To go and close the door somewhere and pray for five hours. It should not stop your intimacy with God. Because God lives on your inside. While you are in that bank, you can be in deep fellowship with God. While you are in that oil business, you can be in deep fellowship with God. While you are in the shop, you can be in deep fellowship. It's only a function of consciousness. Are you aware that God is in your heart? The moment you become aware, you will talk to God in your heart. The power of God can even throw you down, talking to him from your heart. Hope you know that when Hannah was praying, she was not talking. Hannah was praying in her heart. 
until the anointing overwhelmed her, her mouth began to jitter. And the, the, the high priest looked at her and thought she was drunk. That means a man can be drunk from praying in the heart. If you know that God is there, you can pray in the heart and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You can pray in the heart and become drunk. And anything you generate by praying loud, you can also generate it by praying in your heart. Because intimacy is not about prayer time. Intimacy is about an unbroken walk with God. Intimacy is about an unending relationship with God. So you must know how to pray without ceasing. If you must pray and lock the door and shout, how can you pray without ceasing? Because Paul said we should pray without ceasing. The only way you can pray without ceasing is when your prayer migrates into your consciousness. And you also know that God dwells in your heart. So when you leave your prayer room, you are still praying. You have just changed location. When you are driving, you are praying. When you are on your job, you are praying. And as you begin to grow it, a point will come when the intensity will start increasing. And the same things you experience when you are locked behind closed doors, you will start experiencing it when you are driving, praying in your heart. It may take time, but if you are conscious and you develop it, you will master it. Because God is not only in heaven, God is not only in men, God is also on your inside. I've seen many Christians, the moment a man of God stands and begins to impart, you will see them. They become so conscious of God. That's when they fall under the anointing. That's when they start prophesying. If the man stops, they stop. So their whole experience of God is tied to impartation session. And so if the man of God does not do impartation, they have no work with God. They will be dry until somebody stands up. In the name of Jesus, receive life. You say amen. They start jumping. Some start having, it's good. But if it's reduced to only that time, then your work with God is very shallow. You must graduate to knowing that God is in you. And you start building that consciousness and growing in it. That's the first order of intimacy as far as revelation is concerned. at John 14 verse 10. Just take these scriptures down. Go and read them. And spend time to meditate on them. See what Jesus was teaching. Now remember this same Jesus said our father which what? At in heaven. Now see Jesus. Believest thou not that I am in the father and the father in me? He said the words that I speak unto you is not of myself but the father that dwelleth in me jesus knew that the father what dwelled in him the father dwelt in him he said the father that dwelleth in me so every words i'm speaking to you i'm just corresponding and transmitting what the father is saying that's jesus's level of consciousness and jesus was not the only person that sustained that consciousness Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. Look at Paul's consciousness. I'm showing you why men have unbroken relationship with God. He said, because you are sons. He said, God had sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba Father. So as far as Paul is concerned, the Holy Ghost is not just on your inside, but the Holy Ghost is carrying out an intense activity in your inside. The reason you are not sensing that the move of the Holy Ghost is heavy is because you are not conscious. If you are conscious, you will know that the Holy Ghost is not just there. He is crying on your inside. Abba, Father, for that you can keep encountering God on ending. That's what Paul knows. Sometimes Paul can wake up from sleep and the Holy Ghost is screaming. And he enters an encounter from sleep because of a consciousness that he has built. He said the Holy Ghost is on our inside. Crying Abba Father. In fact as far as Paul is concerned. This was God's plan. From the foundation of the world. In Colossians 1 26 and 27. He called it. The hope of glory. So if you will walk with God. Until you are glorified. He said you must have the consciousness. Not that God is in heaven. But that God is on your inside. He said this is the richest of the glory of the mysteries 
that which that Christ in you is the hope of glory. So the reason you will walk with God and be glorified is not because God is in heaven. It's not because God is in another man. It's because you must know that God is on your inside. Too many Christians don't know this. They are not conscious of this. That's why they walk in sin casually. Because as far as they are concerned, nobody saw them. And that's why their prayer life, their study life keeps fluctuating. Because they think they only have a relationship with God when they are kneeling on the altar. Or when they are in a prayer group. Or when they are in a vigil. All of those things are beautiful. But if you will have a rich relationship with God, you must build the consciousness that God is in you. For some of us, we, mo we may write, need to write this scripture and talk it to ourselves for a long time. Because this awareness is something you come into by the Holy Ghost. It's not mental. It's, it's something that should provoke a consciousness. So you have to meditate on it until it becomes your reality. Hear what Jesus told the disciples in John 14, 16 and 17. It's a consciousness. It's not just a mental knowledge. He said, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter and he, that he may abide with you forever. Now go to verse 17. He said, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. So he's not just about abiding with you. It's also coming to enter you. He said, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. He said, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. When the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Ghost came, he now entered them. And everybody who receives Christ, the Holy Ghost enters you before he comes upon you. Because that's how you receive eternal life. So God is more interested in God in you, even much more than God with you. But if you don't have that consciousness, you can't have a relationship with God. There are many religious people. And the way you know them is that when they are outside church, they don't sense God. They live their life as if God does not exist until they come to church, until they come to prayer meeting, or until they enter their prayer closet. But when you find a spiritual man, anywhere, anytime, he carries the consciousness of God. He can talk to God and hear from God anywhere, anytime. In fact, sometimes if you are in a business meeting and things are getting hot, you bend down on your table and for some seconds, you talk to the Father in your spirit before you continue with the conversation because you know that even for that 10 seconds, God can whisper something to you. You know he's that close to you. It's on the strength of that that you build a robust relationship with God. The first dimension of revelation or revelation-based intimacy is that God is not just in heaven. God is not just in men, but God is in you. The second dimension of revelation that provokes intimacy are the cadres of spiritual knowledge. There are five cadres of spiritual knowledge. And anybody who will have intimacy with God by revelation must journey through these cadres. Number one of those cadres is what we call gnosis. Gnosis. There is a knowledge called gnosis. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 5. Second Peter. It said, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And to virtue knowledge the word knowledge here is the word gnosis what is gnosis gnosis is a scientific understanding of a reality something you can cognitively explain now this level of intimacy is not to know god necessarily but is to know about god this is the basic level of intimacy that everybody has now every christian here if you ask them, they can tell you Jesus is the son of God. It does not really mean they know what son of God means. But at least they can explain to you and say, yes, he was born of a virgin. The Holy Ghost came upon Mary and she was born. So they can explain it cognitively. Now, because of this, there's a level of consciousness of God they have. But if that's all you know about God, you can't walk in purity. If that's all you know about God, you can't raise the dead. 
If that's all you know about God, you cannot stand when somebody is dying and say, come back to life. Because even you, you know that knowledge is passive. But because you are a cognitive being, you must of necessity interact with God at a cognitive level. But the journey of intimacy is deeper than that. So when you leave the level of gnosis, you come to the second level of knowledge-based intimacy, which is idol. Now you become aware. God becomes more specific to you. You from the general level of explaining God and knowing about God to becoming aware. Have you had this situation before where you had maybe a spoon in your hand and you are looking for it? How many of you have had that situation? You are preparing quickly to go to work. You carried your comb and you have the comb in your hand and you are looking for the comb and you are angry with everybody. Who carried this comb from here? What is wrong with these people? Until you go out and you are asking somebody for comb. You now say, but what are you holding in your hand? You now look at it. You will be wondering why you didn't drop the comb when you were angry. So you had that knowledge all the way, but you were not aware of it. That moment of realization that, ah, the comb is with you, is what we call idol. Idol means to realize. Idol means to perceive. So when God wants to grow you in intimacy, from time to time, he'll begin to give you realizations and perception. Realizations and perception. So you can wake up one day and just realize that, but I should not be sick. And if you were sick, the sickness will go. It doesn't necessarily mean you have knowledge of divine health. That sickness will go that time, but you will still fall sick again. Because you were just aware momentarily of a reality. You have not grown in it. That's the level of knowledge of God that many persons have. Now, if you want to grow into Gnosis, you must read about God. But if you want to grow into idol, you must begin to consciously spend time with the Holy Spirit. Because the first level of spiritual interaction the Holy Ghost brings to you is to begin to punctuate realizations into your spirit. From time to time, something will come to your spirit. It's like God flashing light, flashing light in your spirit. As that is happening, you can come and say, if you invite some people to talk here now, they can tell you, in 2005, God told me this. That was the last time they received a flash. So they, they have punctuations. But a man who has grown in intimacy, even as he's talking now, he will tell you, now let's pray God wants to speak. His talk with God is not 10 years ago. It's not 5 years. God no longer flashes. God is now a movement. God is a stream. He can plug in anytime. And he can live there. So you must also grow from the level of idol. But the way to activate idol is to be spending time with God from time to time so that flashes can be coming. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to verse 13, the word was used. Let me show you. It said this is the record that God has given us eternal life and that this life is in his son. Go further, verse 12. It said he that had the son has life and he that had not the son has not life. Now verse 13 is my emphasis. It said these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. The word know there is the word I do. So it's telling you, become aware that there's another life on your inside. You may not have mastered how to walk that life, but at least know that there is eternal life. Perceive it, become aware, realize that there's eternal life in you. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, is that same word Paul used. He said, whoever is in Christ Jesus, it's a new creation. All things are passed away. It said, behold, all things have become new. The word behold is the word idol. So they, when God wants to start drawing you to himself, what God does is that he begins to make you realize that you have some things. That's why sometimes when we are preaching here, you hear us talking again and again that we are not ordinary. We are not ordinary. We have the anointing of God. We have the life of God. We have the faith. What we are trying to do is to create awareness. Many persons will leave that service and become aware that they too have faith. They never knew. They will become aware that they have eternal life. They will become aware that they have anointing. But that does not mean they will walk in the anointing. But at least now, they, they, they walk with a level of consciousness that the life of God is in them. They walk with a level of consciousness that they have faith. They walk with a level of consciousness. If they will grow, they will need to know more than awareness. So you move from gnosis, you come to idol, 
then you proceed to epignosis when you come to epignosis you are now beginning to experience some of the things that you were aware of so you you knew you had the anointing of god you were aware that you had it but you went somewhere somebody was sick and then you just sense a leading to pray for the person and as you touch the person you sense something leave you into the person and the person tells you ah the pain is gone now you know you are not just anointed you have also experienced the anointing you have felt the anointing you have touched the tangibility of the anointing now for you the anointing will be more real to you than the guy who is just aware that is anointed because the guy who is aware that is anointed if you ask him he will tell you well that's what the bible says but you now it's not just what the bible says you have experienced the measure of it you hear some of our brothers share the testimonies here that the first time they told them that they could pray for the sick they were afraid after a while they became sure that they too could pray for his for the sick after a while they actually prayed for the sick and the sick got healed so they have moved from the level of i can pray for the sick they have moved to the level of i will pray for the sick now they have prayed for the sick and the sick is healed so they are growing in knowledge from level to level that's how your work with god is there's a level where you know about god there's a level where you realize that truly god is alive and god is in my life but there's a level where you start seeing markers of god and you start experiencing god so as you come to this level now you now become conscious if i need a job god can talk to me if i need to get married god can talk to me if i need to start a business god can talk to me so you will now no longer take steps just like that you will now start seeking god so you see that when it has to do with gnosis it took scientific analysis you need a developed mind when it has to do with idol you need to stay in god's presence so that from time to time the holy ghost can tell you but when it has to do with epignosis you must pay the price to see god so you no longer take step until god speak so now you have added discipline you have added hunger to your work with god so god now sees that the experience he gave you you don't just want to have it once in a while you want it to become your life it's on the strength of this now that you will now check your timetable and say every day i will pray for one hour it's on the strength of this that you say every week i will fast twice because you want to consciously work with god you want to know god and you want to experience god you don't just want to have touch the flashes and encounters once in a while you want to live in the realm of encounters now epignosis is a spiritual knowledge triggered by the holy ghost to bring men into experiences in god it's not longer what you read it is the god that you have handled the same way he said that which was from the beginning we saw now we have handled when you have handled it means you have come into epignosis two people can come for a healing service the person who prayed for the sick maybe once in a while and sees one or two healing will not have the same faith like the man who organizes healing service every week this one who organizes healing service every week he has passed through praying and people die to praying people are healed to pray until he has built some level of consistency so if this man come before he start the service he can tell you god will heal the sick today that means his work with god is stronger than the other person the one who has idol will be hoping maybe the holy ghost will do something today maybe the holy ghost will show me something today but the one who has epignosis he knows that the holy ghost will always show something so when he comes for the meeting he will announce before time god will touch people when i was teaching in cameroon this night before the last night was a revival night it was explosive when i now came for the last night i told them tonight you will not feel fire tonight i want to show you the name of jesus and when i'm done god will walk in miracles and i finished teaching when i finished explaining the name of jesus before i prayed and i told them i'm not sensing the anointing but this truth i've used it many times i know it now it must work I now prayed for the sick before we took testimonies i asked them why do you think people will be healed everybody looked at me i said they must be healed i now said if you are healed stand up and the crowd stood up and it's not i have headache tumors were leaving people's bodies 
people who couldn't walk were walking because i have used this name of jesus several times i used it in kenya i used it in zambia i used it in pakistan i used it in london now i know that name by experience so when i say jesus it's not because a theologian told me i've gone to places before where people were waiting you say you are doing miracle today we are waiting and i was i was between the devil and the deep blue sea what do i do it was that name of jesus that took me out of there so if i come to another place i have no reason to fear i have experienced it it's called epignosis how do you grow in epignosis you grow in epignosis through consistent seeking through consistent engagement so a man who wants to have intimacy with god must engage god until god becomes an experience i'm telling you why when we teach on intimacy we talk about fasting we talk about prayer it's not the fasting and prayer in itself it's the consistency requirement for you too to experience god it is on this wise that intimacy becomes a business of responsibilities if you don't take responsibility you cannot have intimacy with god you find the scripture it is replete look at what peter said i read the scripture for you already second peter 1 verse 5 see what peter said we'll read it to verse 8 he said and beside this giving all diligence add to your faith virtue and to your virtue what this is what i do are you seeing this he now went further verse 6 and he said and to i do add temperance and to temperance add patience and to patience add godliness go to verse 7 and to godliness add brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness add love go to verse 8 for if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the epignosis of our lord jesus christ so you had awareness but you started building patience you started building temperance you started building virtue as you were pushing it consistently a point comes when a move from awareness it becomes what you have handled it comes into epignosis so many persons have not grown in their intimacy with god because they stopped at having visions i slept last week i saw a white uh, man talking to me what does he mean so they are asking everybody every day i had uh, my hand was was hot what does he mean i was praying my legs started feel, what how long have you been doing what you are doing you pray once in a month you say you saw fire and you, you are asking what does it mean no what it means is pray more when you stay there for six months you will know what it means they want you to tell them what it means so that they will run with it meanwhile the way the spirit realm works i may sense fire on my hand it will be healing you may sense fire on your hand it may mean prof the prophetic you may sense fire on your hand it may mean run there is danger run they are about to cut your head and so if you don't know this thing by experience you will now sense fire on your hand and you say god wants to raise the dead here they are sharpening your cutlass <laughs> because you are that dead that will die and raise on the last day so the, when you are walking with god apprehend him don't look for things apprehend him the whole idea is to draw you did you see where peter taught this thing in second peter 1 verse 3 and 4 he said according as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the epignosis through the epignosis of him that has called us to glory and virtue and he said by that he has called us to become partakers of the god kind having escaped the corruption that is in the world through law so when it has to do with experience you must walk with god until you partake of him that's the journey of intimacy so if we are talking we need to know where we are because two people can come and say god we heal today one has scientific knowledge about god that's gnosis another one has idol five years ago god healed somebody through him but he has not experienced anything and then another one has epignosis he knows the heal the god that heals when all of them are talking their manifestation will prove where they are in their work with god so when you are working with god you must be conscious to grow this is why we teach these things so if you are still at the level where god is scientific there's so much that you cannot handle you need to grow until you know this god by experience it has happened too consistently that it can't change sometimes i'm in a meeting i sense a signal i will tell you 
with all audacity that this thing is like this. It has become too consistent. That's why I can be in a meeting. I tell you, where that AC is standing there, there's somebody there, you have growth. I've sent some things for long. I've sent it. Sometimes they move like light. As we are talking, it passes. And as it passes, where it stops, something is there. You have done this thing severally. Now you know. And you can bank your life on it. Now, imagine you travel somewhere to preach for one, one day, only one session. And then you tell them, there's somebody on the second row here. You're, you have an air condition. Everybody's not looking. Nobody there. Hmm. The whole service now, you want to redeem yourself. You now say, there's somebody by the right here. Your right leg, your right leg, nobody. What you need to do now is to start praying for the service to end on a good note because you are in trouble. But you see, when epiglosis have been formed, it cannot lie. Because this thing has been proven over time. That's experience. If you want to know God, don't know him scientifically alone. Don't know him by one or two momentary encounters. Seek until you have regular patterns. So that when you see anything, you can explain what it means. And you know it is so. And many times it is so. Then you know that you are growing with God. Now when you are growing into these different levels, they also mean the energy level where you are in God. It means your growth and your intimacy with God is increasing. But that's not all. There is another level of intimacy in knowledge called Gnosko. Epignosis is to experience God. But Gnosko is an experience of God that you can now apply. So you don't just experience it. You can now what? Apply it. You can be praying. And every time you pray and you see fire. God releases judgment on an evil person. You saw it once. You saw it thrice, you saw it four times. The next time, if there is evil, you will go and pray and look for that fire. Because you know that if you can find that fire, there will be judgment. So your ability now to apply that knowledge to produce result is what we call ginosko. Now, this is how men grow in their work with God. Sometimes you go for a meeting. You sense that as you are going for that meeting, your heart was, there was a movement in your heart. And when you went to preach, you preached with fire. You went for the next meeting, you didn't sense it. And even though you were shouting, there was no fire. You were going again, you sensed that fire. It happens once, it happens twice, it happens thrice. You now know that when God is moving on your chest, there's fire. So if you are looking for a revival meeting, you can now announce and say, tomorrow is revival service. You know why? Because you must pray until that fire comes. Because now you have the ginosko, but you can now apply it. You have the epignosis, you can apply it. So if you say tomorrow is revival, you will pray until you sense the fire. You can still be praying till five. The meeting, they have already taken offering, but you are not out yet because you have not sensed the fire. The moment you sense the fire, you can carry your Bible and start running. If you read the altar, fire must come. Now, you know God to a level where you can apply the things of God consciously. You are a prophet. You know that when you are praying and you are praying and something starts moving on your head, you can see with your eyes open. It happened once. It happened twice. It happened thrice. You know what you do? You will first of all sit down and find out what was I doing before that thing started moving on my head. You will now learn it. When you learn it, you will go and write it down and keep it. Any day you want to prophesy, you will go and lock your door and do that thing until the thing begins to move on your head because you know that's the hand of God. If it starts moving, you can say, tell the president to wait for me. He will come as a big man. Because if you come, you must prove God. Now you can put to work. This is how people grow in God. Many people are too careless to study the patterns of the spirit in their lives. And that's why they are in church for 20 years. They are looking for impartation. They are looking because they are not growing in intimacy. They don't know these things. You are a businessman. Every time your hand is on fire, you suddenly have contracts. Ah, you are going for a meeting, your hand is burning. You say, what's wrong with you? You wash it, it's still burning. And suddenly you go, everybody favored you. You don't know why. You say, Kai, this suit I wore today, 
there's a way I appeared. Even the people know. You go to another meeting with the suit, nothing will not happen. Another time you are going for a meeting, your hand is boiling, boiling, burning, burning, and you have favor. What is it with this hand? You now enter practicals. The next time you have a major meeting, you prepare for the meeting two days before. You start praying or you start worshiping. Whatever it is you were doing that your hand burn, was burning, you do it for a long time. When the hand starts burning, you have gotten your answer. You now go to the meeting now with expectation. And if what you are looking for is not happening, you can now demand it. Because every time your hand was burning, you had favor. You now come, they want to behave anyhow with you. You now start making demand. Because now you can apply the knowledge. Because you have put it to work severally. It is called Ginosko. Ginosko. The ability to put to work the things of God. But this is not the highest level. There is a level where you can now begin to be inventive and creative about it. So Ginosko is ability to practice produce result or bear offspring from your interaction with God. Now, why am I saying this? This is revelation-based knowledge. You know why? Because these things, if they are happening in your life, it means you are still at that energy level. Because these things happen at different energy levels. Now, let me explain something to you. And I need you to understand this thing in context. Because I'm not saying, go and stop whatever it is God was doing with you. See the way I am now. Where is my friend? Um, where is my coach? Come. This is my coach. He's the one that mentors me in Jimmy. Although I go once in three weeks. Come up. This is my coach. Celebrating. <laughs> Let me walk with my coach. Now, hmm, he's coming up too. Now, when we went to do deadlift, what was the weight I carried? I carried 60 kg. How many did you carry? 120. You know what is deadlift? They do it to help your back. So they will put the weight. You will stand like this. You will carry it and drop it. Carry it and drop it. So the, it, it affects your back. They call it deadlift. Now, if I start training every day for three weeks, maybe I will shift from 60 to 80 or 90. If he doesn't train for three weeks, if he comes back, he will still carry more. You know why? Because he is already at a muscular energy level. So my practice may keep me fresh but i've not reached here are you seeing that now there's somebody else who is bigger than him who may be carrying 400. even if i train for one year i won't meet the person <laughs> do, do you understand now why am i saying this if this man does not train for two weeks hmm, he will not necessarily feel guilty that he didn't train you know why because he has reached a guaranteed level of 120. If he wants to go to training, he will go to training because he loves Jimmy and because it's beneficial to him, not because he's feeling guilty. That's how it works with intimacy. If you have reached the level of Ginosko and you are seeing those signs, you may be busy, you didn't pray for four days, you didn't pray for five days, you will not allow guilt to overtake you. Because you know that you are in a relationship level with Jesus. Are you seeing that? Now, if you are going back to prayer, you are not going back to prayer because you are feeling guilty. You are going back to prayer because you miss the presence. Because you want to love God. Because you want to grow in God. It's not guilt that is taking you back to prayer. Are you seeing that? Now, there was a time, thank you. There was a time when I was wooing my wife. Mm, those were days. <laughs> I will call and talk. And when I check, later it's three hours. Uh -uh. How did a person talk on phone for three hours? I had to start checking myself. I said, Kai, you have become Kana. <laughs> and I will, I won't even know it's three hours. Now we are married. We are at a guaranteed level now. Now, communication is still important. But when I was in Cameroon, 
Sometimes I talk for 20 minutes in a whole day. I can't talk for three hours because we are doing kingdom and we understand. Now, am I supposed to collapse my, my communication with her? No. But if I communicate with her, I'm no longer communicating to woo her. I have wooed her already. She's now my wife. If I'm communicating with her now, it's because I love her and I'm also taking responsibility as husband. See the problem with many Christians. They don't monitor the level they have grown to in intimacy. And because they don't monitor these things, they are using rituals, activities, and laws to punish themselves. So, somebody didn't pray for one day. It's not because he misses God. It's not because something he has caught in God, he didn't sense it. No. He is paining him because he has no mark record. And so, so long as he goes to pray, whether he touches God or not, is not a factor. As far as he has prayed, that day has been ticked. Now, at a level of growing, it's important. But when you start coming to maturity, you no longer pray to mark record. You pray to keep what you have caught in God. And so long as those things you are caught, you have caught are still there, your intimacy is still intact. Now, this does not suggest that you should stop your daily work with God. But if you know this, guilt can no longer destroy your work with God. You now function by spiritual signs that defines your height in the spirit. And so, so long as you wake up and the Holy Ghost is singing in your heart, it means you are, you are intact. So, there's a level you get, as you wake up, God is singing. So, you know that you are intact. You are intact. I didn't pray yesterday, but I'm intact. The devil can't come from nowhere and whisper, look at you, Kanama, you can't pray. Get out, Satan. I'm talking relationship with my father. How, do you, how did you come here? You see? So, your work with God will no longer be a burden. Because there are many people who are praying, fasting, but it's a burden. They don't have a relationship with God. They are just marking timetable. So that when they go to preach, they can tell you, for the past 70 days, I prayed every day for four hours. The moment the people clap, they have achieved what they want. They go away. They don't have a relationship with God. But for people who have relationship with God, they keep what they have caught. And those markers is what defines to them where they are standing with God. Are you seeing it? This is why we are teaching these things. So long as God still talks to me and I still apply it, it means my relationship is intact. I hear God's voice. The fire of God is on my heart. My relationship is intact. I should pray every day. I should fast regularly. I should study every day. But in case I didn't pray, I won't feel guilty. What I have caught, I've not lost it. It's still there. There's an indicator. God gives you those things to let you know that you are intact with him. You are intact. Are you seeing the difference? This is how you build intimacy. And this is revelation-based intimacy. The final level on this order is what we call dokimazo. Dokimazo is not just that you can apply what God is doing. Now you can use those things to prove that God is there. In Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, hear what the Bible says. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Go to verse 2. He said, And be not conformed to this word, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The word prove is the word dokimazo. There's a level you now get to in your intimacy that you can use your intimacy to verify certain things. So you can come to a place and say, God is here. At this point, you are no longer feeling. You have gone past feeling. Now you know God's presence. Now you need to understand that the journey of relationship is not just to feel things. It's actually to know. Because God's presence is not necessarily felt. It is known. So when you come to the level of deep intimacy with God, you know his presence. So you can prove his presence. So you can come to a place and tell somebody, God, this is where the patriarchs of old went to. Elijah will come to a place and tell you, let's go to the mountain tomorrow. The God that answers by fire is the true God. He's not feeling anything. Now you know that this same Elijah at some point will pray and say until you see something. Elijah comes and say, the God that answers by fire is the true God. 
and then you go to the mountain nothing happens somebody pray from morning till night nothing happens and Elijah comes he now say no before I call fire you may say this place is too dry pour water let the place be wet the place is now wet and Elijah called on God he knows this one knows God and God will answer by fire Elijah sits on the mountain they send soldiers to arrest him and he said except I'm not the servant of God let fire come down and consume you and fire will descend consume second batch fire descend consume when the third batch came the captain was wise they said my lord please don't be offended with your servant <laughs> because he can see the signs <laughs> this thing is no longer coincidence this man knows something he can prove God now when we are talking intimacy God wants us to come to a point where our work with him is so rich that we can prove him so I'm not just a man of study I'm not just a man of fasting I'm not just a man of prayer. I know that I have entered somewhere with God. So if I come into a place, I can say, unless I'm not a servant of God, unless I don't know God, unless I don't have a relationship with God, let this and this and that happen. And when those things happen, they will come back and say, we want to know your God. It means your intimacy has gotten to a level where you can use it to prove and justify what relationship with God is. And so when such men said, my God, know that something will happen. You see what David said? He said, by my God, I ran through a troop. By my God, I leaped over a wall. So the guy has an assurance. No matter the number of the soldiers, I know a God. If I call upon him, I will defeat you. If your work with God has not brought you to that point, where you can stand up and say, no, I serve a God, this business will not fail. It means you don't have intimacy with God. You need to get to that point. Some people will look at you and all their prayer for you is out of fear. Now, when people pray for me like that, I honor their faith, I honor their love, I receive it. But I've gone past that level. Somebody will look at you, he will pray for you for one hour. And all the prayer that is that you will not fear. This thing will not fumble. This thing will not collapse. Uh, uh, am, am, we, am I planning to fear? You come to a point where you say, as surely as the Lord God liveth, this thing can't fail. And you are not just boasting. You know God. There's a knowledge. That's what this, the guy said in Daniel 11, 32b. They that do know they are God. That is a level of knowledge that proves God's faithfulness. Proves God's mercy. Proves God's ability. And if what we are doing is intimacy, it must bring us there. How far have you traveled with God? There are many people who are praying, they are fasting, but their life is still full of uncertainty. They cannot tell you anything, even about where they are. Uncertainty. And because the devil knows, the devil will just be doing a lot of things around them. They woke up, they say, Kai, I had a dream yesterday. I don't know, will this business still work? This business, so long as I'm involved, it must work. If the devil likes, if you show all the dream in hellfire, it will stop this business. So the devil is not the one that dictates how you operate. You now know God. But it's a journey. It's a journey from scientific knowledge of God to momentary or temporary awareness of God to experience of God to application of God to a point of absolute assurance. There used to be a time when if I'm going for a meeting, I will pray until I sense either something on my tongue or on my heart. There are times when I'm praying, my heart becomes heavy. Heavy. That as I'm walking, sometimes I can't even breathe. I know that is the glory of God. It has saturated me. If I go for that meeting, something supernatural must happen. But my brothers and sisters, if I'm going for any meeting now, anything I want to happen, that's what will happen. Because I've come to know God that is beyond my activities. Now, those things I was doing, I'm still doing them. Don't get me wrong. But now I've come to know God that he is predisposed to doing this thing much more than I'm asking him. I'm not the one who will beg God to heal his people. I don't love those people half as much as God loves them. God is planning to heal them more than I mean. In fact, I will be the one to limit God from healing them. 
Because what God wants to do in a meeting, I'm the one that will limit him. So I've come to know God's love. I'm come, I've come to know God's faithfulness to a level that if I come to a meeting, my prayer most time is, Father, please let me not hinder you here. Have your way. And as you talk with assurance, God keeps answering and answering and answering. But you see, you kept journeying with God. You kept journeying with God until you came to that point where you are not psyching yourself. In fact, you can put your life on the line. You can call somebody who is sick and tell the person, you know the way John G. Lake did it? Now, John G. Lake had a healing program. You know what he calls it? It's not supernatural healing, no. He calls it divine, he called it divine healing technician. He said, when a doctor is coming to treat you, he's coming with assurance. He knows what to do to get the result he's looking for. So he called his prayer people technicians. And when you are coming for the John G. Lex program, he will tell you it's for 30 days. Most times they will tell you to pledge something. Stake something. Put money or put something. They are not taking it. But they are trying. To, it's just like having a contract with you that if you are not healed, you can sue me. That's the level of audacity the guy had. If you come for this meeting and you don't miss, if by the end of this program you are not healed, sue me. You can take me to court. The guy knew that God cannot lie. God cannot deny himself. It's a level of knowledge of God. He has come into an assurance. Now, if you have not journeyed in intimacy, you didn't even reach Ginosko where you send some, like, okay, there's a Tielos born who, if he's preaching, he's waiting. When the fire hit his hand, he will stop preaching. He will carry a chair and sit down. He doesn't need atmosphere. He said, the power of God is in my hand. Hold me. Cancer will die. Blindness open. So long as he's there. That's Ginosko. You have not reached a level where you pick a sign and you apply it. You are still at the scientific level. Because you heard somebody say something and it happened. You too came. And meanwhile, it's your pride that is pushing you. You said, tomorrow if God does not hear, it means God does not exist. <laughs> Be careful. When the time now comes, you now start trying to blackmail God. Lord, please, your name will not be embarrassed here. Your name will not be blasphemed here. Lord, prove yourself in this place. Father, you must prove yourself. So it's in that your small meeting that God will prove himself. God proved himself when he created the world. God proved himself when he rose Jesus from the dead. You are the one now that will prove your ministry. <laughs> Prove your ministry. Prove your calling. Leave God out of the equation. But you see, it's a journey. It's a journey. I wish I had time to talk to you about intimacy by consecration, but we're out of time. Maybe next week, Tuesday, when I come, I will teach you intimacy by faith. I will also teach you intimacy by consecration. But intimacy by faith is based on three things. Write it down. Go and study just in case I don't have time to teach it. If you study the Holy Ghost, it give you understanding. Intimacy by faith is number one, based on what is predominantly accepted where you are. So when you come to an environment where people believe knowing God means prophesying, you will discover that your intimacy with God will be narrowed along the lines of prophecy. If you come to a, point, a place where people believe that knowing God is by prayer. Your intimacy with God will be narrowed along the lines of prayer. If you come to a place where people believe that knowing God is to walk in healing, your intimacy with God will be narrowed along the lines of healing. If you come to a place where people believe that knowing God is about quoting scriptures, your intimacy will be narrowed along the lines. But you see, the danger of operating that way is that when you find anything outside of that narrow corridor that you know, it will defeat you. And it will affect your faith. And it will affect your work with God. So you must move from building intimacy based on what is predominantly accepted. For example, this apostolic movement now, people believe intimacy with God is to have utterance and to pray. Because most of the apostles are people that have fluid utterance and they preach prayer. And so you will see an arrogant and proud person who doesn't know God 
Because he comes and prays. Or if he carries the microphone, he starts talking mysteries and talking fast, talking fast, talking fast. He thinks he has stature with God. That is intimacy based on predominant occurrence. Knowing God is deeper than that. That may be a level, but your work with God has to be deeper than that. Now, the second level of intimacy by faith is knowing God based on what has happened to you in the past. And this is also good because you can invoke God's faithfulness. Lord, you did it yesterday, you do it again. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. But you see, because your experiences fluctuate and because your experiences are not only positive, if you build your intimacy based on what you have experienced in God yesterday, you will still be limited. Because you prayed for the sick yesterday, the sick was healed. But you also prayed day before yesterday and the sick was not healed. You see that? So if you are building your intimacy based on the experience of God yesterday, based on the positive things God did, you can enjoy some impact tomorrow. But there are also other negative things that the devil can inject into your consciousness. So as beautiful as it is to build intimacy based on predominant happenings, as beautiful as it is to build intimacy based on your past experience of God, there is one place of absolute assurance if it is faith you are working with. That kind of intimacy, text where you find yourself, there is intimacy based on previous experiences with God, but if it is faith, make sure in addition to those two, it is what is written. That's why Jesus himself, when the devil met him, he was the, he is the word, but he said, it is written. It is written. The disciples said, knowing this first, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. He said, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the spirit of God. Why was Peter saying this? Peter said, we were at the mountain of transfiguration. We saw the highest dimension of revelational experience, but we will not compare it with the scripture. It is written, will be constant. He said, heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of my word will pass away. So it's good to build your faith based on what the Christian around Christians around you are doing. You will know God. We pray here. So if you come through prayer, you will know God. We preach the word of God here. So through hearing the word, you will know God. But you must know God beyond what we are doing here because what we are doing here is not all God is about. This is the lead to God has shown us. Are you seeing that? Now, you have seen God do something for you yesterday. But you must know God beyond those experiences. The way to walk with God and not fluctuate is to function by it is written. When I check the fathers of old, their faith is built on the revelation of the word. You see a man who has raised the dead, he will come and stay on scripture. You will see a man who prophesied with his eyes open, he will come and stay on scripture. Because they know experiences can fluctuate. Whether it is corporate or personal in the past, it can fluctuate. So in order for your work with God not to fluctuate, stay with what is written. Because this one can never change. I was listening to John Austin, the father of Joel Austin. If he comes to service, the first thing they do is they carry their Bible and they have a mantra. They will say, I am what the word says I am. I have what the word says I have. I can do what the word says I can do. I must be taught by the word daily. My heart is open to receive the word. I will never be the same again. That's how they start service. To let you know that whatever experience you see here, the word is superior. Because experiences can change. But the word will never change. So intimacy built on faith can begin from corporate experience of your context it can also be based on the faithfulness of god in the past but make sure you transit it to what the word says the more you accept what the word says and become what the word says the closer you will become with god the richer your intimacy with god will be that's why you must not build intimacy based on context alone most of you who are here you love my work with God. You do things the way I do things. But even me that you are looking at, I am grossly deficient. Another man of God can walk here. 
and what he has with God will dwarf everything I have with God. So if you think all we are doing here is what intimacy is about, it means you are already limited before you started. And if you leave us here and go to another aspect of the body of Christ, you will see that probably everything we believe here, they don't even do it. There are places where they come, they just lift holy hands, worship God, sit down, teach the word of God. And as they are teaching the word of God, people cross their leg. They understand it in simple English. When they finish, they clap hands and worship God, give offering and go home. And there are people there who know God. Meanwhile, here we are praying like warriors. We are praying. And when we are teaching the word, we are teaching with temper and fire. You will now think intimacy. You have left intimacy. Now you are in gesticulation. You are in charisma. And you can master the charisma and not know God. Why am I teaching you this? So you don't limit your work with God. Because you can become like the environment, but you will miss God. And that's what's happening in the apostolic move now. You see people preaching, they are preaching in a certain way because every, every lead apostle in the move has his own charisma. So people are now patterning themselves after charisma, but they don't know God. When you deal with them closely, you discover these people, they are far from God. And that's what the Pharisees did in their time. Because the goal of the Pharisees is acceptance and popularity. Jesus looked at them and said, you travel land and sea to make one proselyte and turn him to a, a disciple of hair twice. Because now we don't even care whether people are growing. So long as they are mimicking us and acting like us, we are in order. That's not intimacy. You may begin from there, but the way you know you are growing in God and building your relationship with God is begin to resemble the scripture. It is written, must become your own experience. That's intimacy by faith. And finally, it's intimacy by consecration. Intimacy by consecration has three cadres. The first cadre is prayer and the word. Acts chapter 6 verse 4. He said, we will not give ourselves to tables, but to prayer and the ministry of the word. And I've, I've taught you a lot on prayer. I've taught you a lot on the word. So you know what that means. The second aspect of intimacy by consecration is a life of purity. And purity in this context, majorly, is sexual purity and purity with finances. If your work with God is intact, you discover that your sexual propensities will be curtailed. The moment your work with God is affected, your emotions start going haywire. And because of money, you start compromising. So when a man is growing with God in intimacy by consecration, one of the indicators that shows that his intimacy is intact is that his sexual thoughts and sexual life will be pure and his dealings with money will be pure there will be no compromise and finally intimacy by consecration is reflected in service when your intimacy with god is growing your passion for the work of god will be growing the moment your intimacy goes down the things of god becomes difficult some of you who are going out every saturday for soul winning you don't know that is fire burning in you. If that fire goes down, you'll be shocked. You want to go out on Saturday, you'll be so tired. I see some of you, you go out to neighborhood, you carry microphones, you are preaching. You are not even ashamed. It's fire, it's intimacy that is pushing you. If that intimacy becomes weak, you discover that you can't go out anymore. You just hear that God say, give, you give, you give, you don't think you are giving. It's fire. When that fire goes down, you can't give that seed you are giving anymore. So when people are serving, it is actually a revelation of intimacy. Now, why is this important? So that you know that it's not only when you are praying loud that you are intimate with God. When you are intimate with God, it also reveals by your passion to serve Him. Why do you think somebody can come, clean everywhere, arrange the chairs, wait, attend service, service finishes, he packs the chair and he's not tired? There's a fire burning on his inside. Ask somebody else who is not on fire for God to go out and win souls. I remember those days I was in 100 level. One brother won't let me rest. 
the moment is 5 a.m he will just come and tap all the disciples and say let's go and pray what kind of thing is this i became so offended at this brother so the moment is 4 30 i will stand up and go and lie down under the bunk somewhere else so he will come and look for me he won't find me <laughs> it was a burden to go out because that 4 30 to 6 that's when the air blows the trees are moving you you feel yourself and this guy will come and drag us we'll go and stay in one garden praying in tongues i said this man doesn't mean well for me when i i dodged him for three weeks he became tired he will see me and say before he talks i say sir i'm coming to your room later let's connect for i'm not coming anywhere i've gone my way but the same you now you wake up in the morning you are praying in tongues you are going in the night you are praying in tongues every week you are preaching every week try tell yourself hmm? give yourself a timetable tell yourself for the next four weeks i will go out for evangelism twice a week and see if you can keep it if you can keep it for four weeks it means you're on fire for god i'm telling you why because some of you may think because you are fasting you're on fire there are different dimensions of intimacy if you have passion for god the work of God will become easy. I remember those days when we were in Christ, Christ Embassy. Hmm. We will go to church when we finish serving. Because our cell members need transport, we will have to carry our money and give them. Because if they trek home, they won't come the next service. We will not give them money. We will not trek home. The other time, I trekked home over four kilometers. When I came home, I was so tired. I fell on the rug. I couldn't stand up to remove my shoe because of the tiredness. A scorpion beat me twice, stung me twice at the back. I couldn't even wake up. My back squashed the scorpion. When I now woke up in the morning and saw the scorpion, I quickly snapped it. It was a trophy. <laughs> I said they shall step upon serpents and scorpion. <laughs> you will not feel bad. There is fire. But when a man does not have intimacy with God, if he comes, if you even complain, he's offended, he has left. I'm not doing again. You need to give them five phone calls before they join you for evangelism. Just know that there's no intimacy there. But when a man has intimacy, he will even come before the leader. Because intimacy is reflected through service. If you study the scripture, you'll find it. In Mark 16, 17, Jesus told them to go out. These signs will follow them. And in Mark 16, 20, say, Lo, I'm with you. So when a man is serving, God is with him. In Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20, he said, Go into all the world. And he said, I'll be with you until the end of the age. So if you serve God, there is a fire burning. In 2 Timothy 4, 5, he said, Do the works of an evangelist. For those of you who preach regularly, try it and see. If your prayer fire goes down or your word fire goes down or your fasting goes down you'll be shocked even when it's service time you won't feel like coming try it and see how it works when you start preaching every week hmm, maybe once a week if anything happens to your sexual purity if anything happens to your prayer life if anything happens to your study life you will be shocked you will hate coming to preach if it's time to preach you will start looking for every excuse that's why you see most pastors who are not on fire every sunday they are looking for somebody to come and preach they are so tired with the preaching the word of god because service is powered by intimacy bow your heads and pray ask the lord to help you Ask the Lord to help you. There's a revelation based intimacy. First of all, it's about the position of God. So you are talking proximity between you and God. You have a revelation of proximity. God in heaven, God in men, and then ultimately God in you. And then you have a revelation and knowledge of God from a scientific understanding of God to an awareness of God 
to an experience of God then to an application of God and ultimately to a state and a place where you can prove everything God says he is in your own life so you have Gnosis, you have Ido, you have Epignosis, you have Ginosko and you have Dokimazo they are levels of revelation and knowledge of God and then you come to faith based intimacy intimacy that is based on your exercise of your faith based on the location you found yourself if you meet prophetic people intimacy is prophesy if you meet healing people intimacy is healing if you meet prayer people intimacy is prayer but you need to move beyond your context and begin to know God's faithfulness in your own life and many times you will now start tracing your intimacy to God's faithfulness in the past but even that one is not enough because your experiences fluctuate intimacy by faith is based on the revelation of the word you must come to a point where what the word says is your personal experience it means by faith you have known him and then you have intimacy based on service and when it has to based on consecration and when it has to do with consecration it is prayer fasting and 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 the word and then it migrates to purity sexual purity financial purity and then it migrates to finally service fire jesus said the zeal of my father's house has consumed me so the reason you go there is because god draws you it's not the activity necessarily it's the drawing of the spirit by the time you get here then you can enjoy the full benefits of intimacy and i gave you five of them i said intimacy increases the quality of your life because when you know him you have life number two i said intimacy provokes transformation and transfiguration number three i said intimacy confess upon you dominion number four i said intimacy brings direction and productivity and number five i said intimacy causes you to walk in the fullness of god all of this can be yours but you have to journey and grow in all of the dimensions of intimacy ah